may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon and welcome to this live safari from the Masai Mara in Kenya. My name is Scott Dyson. Oh, I forgot to take my glasses off. I do that quite often these days. And we've got Senzo on camera. We've been out all day. So for those of you who are with us on the morning safari, you'll be glad to know that we've continued our adventures exploring the roads, trying to capture some river crossings. We haven't had the most luck, but this is Safari Live. Ready. Standing by. And welcome. Now, maybe we should go down here. I've never been down this road, so the part of my plans for today was doing as, as much exploring as possible to work out the road networks and the cool spots in the Masai Mara. Now, we've got Jamie who's also headed out in another vehicle. She's just left camp now, so she'll be scratching around, possibly looking for some members of the Angama Pride who she left this morning. They were quite hungry when she left them. So good prospects there for this evening. And Brent will be in the studio again. So that's that. We've had a wonderful day out. Not the most luck with regards to crossings. As we arrived at a lot of the crossings, they came to an end. And sadly, the one or two that we did see area with no signal, so it made it tricky for us to share with you on Facebook Live. This is a beautiful spot, and there's an elephant ahead of us crossing the river. Oh, you've got one floppy ear. It's not often you actually see elephants with broken cartilage in the ears like that. Looks like his might also have a big tear in it. It's going to cause no major issues to him though. The ear hole is on the front of that flap, not behind it, so it's not going to affect his hearing. Possibly slightly his cooling because those are the elephant's radiators. That's how they keep cool, by pumping liters and liters of blood through each ear every minute. And that's why typically in the hotter parts of the day, or times of the day, they'll be flapping the ears more furiously than when it's cooler. And it is quite cool now, especially... So that would have cooled them down. And there's a crocodile, if you just go down a little bit, Senzo, there's a... There we go, there's a crocodile. No, no, oh! So no, it was just on the on this closer bank swimming. Here he goes. He's coming up onto this closer bank. Well, there we go. Oh, two. Is it two crocodiles? Yes, two crocodiles. And that is the scary thing with these beasts: is they can just appear out of nowhere. Or is that a reed? I may have been wrong. That could have been a piece of debris floating down. Oh, I can hear some thunder in the distance. Hopefully you're not going to get drenched with rain, but as I look around, it appears like we're okay for the time being. So what we learned today with the crossings is that they do happen throughout the day, from as soon as we... ...already crossing before we got there. So 
sorry about the technical issues. I'm obviously in a very low-lying area, so let me seek out some higher ground where we're going to avoid these problems. But I'm glad we got to experience this pretty little spot together, first time round. As I was saying, what we've learned today is that the crossings can occur at any stage of the day, from as we arrived there early in the morning. Continuing to cross. Apologies again, but welcome back. An interesting thing that I've realized is that the Mara River is actually quite low at the moment. It's lower than it normally is, so it's actually favorable conditions for the zebra and the wildebeest to cross. Not so favorable for the crocodiles. They prefer it, I guess, when there's more flowing water. It makes them, it gives them the upper hand. So, good conditions for the wildebeest and zebra to be crossing this year. And it is important for all of you to know that Kenya is experiencing quite a, quite a serious drought at the moment. Um, you wouldn't think so looking around here, but this is ordinarily a very, very lush area. So, had the rains been normal, you'd probably find the grass would be even longer and still more green than it is at the moment. And it's been going on for about a year, year and a half now. They, Kenya, throughout the country, just hasn't been receiving enough rain. So that would explain why the river's not flowing as it normally does. Okay, this is the next little alley that we are going to be exploring. Now for any of you who may be watching for the first time, I must let you know that this is happening live. And if you don't believe me, send through your name and hometown to hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and then we can prove that it is in fact real. Or you can just send through questions, let me know where you're from, what you're up to, or any questions you may be interested to know about the Maasai Mara or Safari in general. This looks like a newly worked on road. It's not necessarily a new road, it's just been graded, which is good that the park's doing their bit to make our lives easier getting from A to B. So I think there's just a series of little kind of one-way cul-de-sacs that arrive at viewing points along the river. And what we're going to do is we're slowly going to work our way back upstream along the western bank of the Mara River until eventually we get to the river. We Hi and welcome. Oh goodness, I left my speaker on so I could listen to what Scott was saying. Okay, so we're, I'm short of a cameraman at this very moment. So, hi, oh here comes the cameraman. Uh, we are busy frantically trying to get everything ready. Um, this is not the cameraman who's supposed to be with me, but thank you Dangerous Dave for stepping in. Anytime. My name is Brent Yeo Smith and we are live in the studio. So we get to look up over the Maasai Mara. I've got all sorts of gadgets and toys and stuff to play with. Um, and uh, unfortunately, my big map, that's, or James's big map that goes on here, we can't use today. The table has been freshly oiled. So a lovely smell, uh, nice linseed oil on the table to make it, keep it going. You can see the startings of the shelves have been done, and that's why this fan is here to blow the, the dust of, of the, the woodwork away. But uh, we, this is basically our control room where we look out over the morrow, we can see what the other presenters are doing and we've got other big maps here that we can figure out where everyone is, where the different animals are from. Hi, Tiggs. Tiggs would like to know what, when is the best time to visit the Mara? 
Now, that is a very interesting question. Uh, I'd say all year round. Now, of course, most people come to the Mara to see the crossings. The crossings are currently happening in this area where we are here, uh, below Lookout Hill. There's, um, that's Fig Tree Crossing. Then there's Lookout 1, 2, 3, and I've forgotten the name of that one over here. But there we go. Those are, those are the crossings that are currently happening at the moment. And uh, that's what a lot of the people come to see, is the crossing and the great migration of 1.56 million wildebeest, 200,000 tommies, 200,000 zebra, and a few lost in it. Okay, now, I'd say I quite like the Mara all year round because the game viewing is absolutely fantastic and anywhere throughout these areas it doesn't matter the time of the year you have resident topi, zebra, uh, Thompson's gazelle, Grant's gazelle and the really cool thing as well is that the lions, leopards, cheetahs and hyenas never leave because if they had to move from the Maasai Mara and follow the migration into the Serengeti, they would obviously meet other lions, leopards, hyenas, and cheetahs. And that would cause them to run into a bit of a brick wall. So the lions and stuff to never, never leave. Now, Jack's mom would like to know, would, has the drought really affected the migration? Well, we're very lucky in the Mara that it, out, of, out of all the places in Kenya, we've had late rain. So it's been quite lucky. We haven't experienced the same amount of the drought that the rest of East Africa is having. So there we go, you can see it's still quite green and the grass is very long. Now, how this has affected the migration that has caused it. So well, speaking of rain, there's a great big thunderstorm blaring down on the opposite side of the Mara River. And we are very late for there to be big thunderstorms. So uh, fortunately for us, we are still getting quite a bit of rain. And that is going to keep the wildebeest here longer. And that's how it affects uh, the migration. So, in, so it affects the migration that they have arrived much earlier than they would normally. So they would normally be arriving, maybe just arriving across the Sand River now. They're not normally crossings at this time of year. They're not normally in the Triangle. There's also, strange, wait, let me get back to my map. As we've seen, uh, there are wildebeest streaming in from the Lamai Wedge. Now that is this little wedge over here. That is the Lamai Wedge. And it is the Tanzanian side of the Mara River. Now, the wildebeest have already started coming in to here from the Lamai Wedge, which is very unusual for this time of the year. And uh, normally they're the last of the wildebeest to arrive, so they'll be arriving at the end of next month. So, very, very exciting for us. The fact that there is so much, there has been a lot more rain, not normal rain, because you can see the river is quite low, but the rain for the river starts up there! There! In, in the Ma Highlands. So the Ma Highlands hasn't had as much river, a river rain as the Mara. So it means they're early and they're going to stay longer. Okay, well we're going to keep playing with James's toys in the studio while we do that. Let's go back to Scotty who's driving straight towards that wondrous, glorious, life-giving rain. So... I'm looking forward to seeing the retakes of Brent in James's studio. I haven't seen Brent in the studio before and I'm sure you're all enjoying his antics in there. I'm thoroughly enjoying the scenery and all of the new roads that we are getting to explore work out what's what's oh we've got somebody that's in a bit more of a rush than us thankfully Senzo my human review mirror notified me of that hello to Monique hope you're doing well you would like to know what is the most unusual or unique thing that I've seen in the Mara so far and two things come to mind one happened today and one happened two days ago 
The first thing that happened two days ago was to see hyena mating. In all my years in the bush, I've never seen hyena mating. And it kind of took us by surprise. It was the last thing we were expecting. I initially thought it was a, a, a juvenile male that was kind of just trying to maybe learn the ropes, you could say. Um, as he looked quite clumsy, clumsy initially and didn't look like he was going to be able to pull off the act. But then, all of a sudden... He made a plan and they were mating and they remained coupled together for quite some time. So that's one of the most unique things I've seen thus far. And the other, I'm going to show you on my phone, it's of a little bird nest that we found today. I'm not exactly sure what kind of a bird it is. It's a kind of a lark. And it's so cute. It's on the floor actually. So there you go. You can see the three of them there. Oh. Steph sending messages to our group, making sure we're all doing what we're supposed to be doing. So there we go, you've got an idea of what those three cute little larks look like. They're on the ground, nestled right next to a rock. I think I did take one photo, so there we go, let me show you the photo of where they are. So, oh no, that, this is a different nest we found. But that's kind of where they nest, just right on the side of a rock. This one's nest was... Just over there, you can kind of see the edge of the nest. So it's a kind of lark. I did take a picture of it, and I plan to identify it when I get back home tonight. That's my homework for this evening. And Monique, I'm sure we're going to continue to see a whole bunch of interesting things. And the next few months and years are going to be thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyable for all involved in this epic adventure. to Aaron. Are you interested to know a little bit more about the migratory birds that we can expect to find here? And I'm actually not entirely sure what to expect. I need to do some homework on that, but I'm sure when you get back to Brent in the studio, he'll be able to cast a little bit more insights onto that. I know he's clued up on that department of things. Quite a few, though, will be similar birds that we find down in Juma. Some migrate all the way through the Mara, on their way down to the South Africa, and then they'll pass through on the way back. So I guess European bee eaters would be one. White storks would be another one that would stop off here. And a whole bunch more steppe eagles, steppe buzzards. So I'm sure a lot of the birds that make it all the way down south also pass through here. Speaking of birds, here's a pretty one. It's actually the first one we've seen all day. Hello, Lilac Breasted Roller. I hope you're having a relaxed day as you wait for an insect to forgive, forgo its position. And that's how they do their hunting. They stay perched like this. Ooh, I'm not sure if you heard that thunder. But that's a beautiful sound, if you can hear it. Always tricky to know whether you can pick up and hear exactly what I'm hearing. Sometimes you can hear and see things better than I can, actually. And sometimes it's the other way around. Okay. Well, it doesn't seem like any bugs are wanting to donate themselves to the Lilac Breasted Roller's meal plan. So we shall continue.
Looks like there's a very large journey of giraffe in front of us, so that's some good prospects to look forward to. Oh, this is going to be good. There's a whole bunch of them. Well, I'm glad we managed to make it through the rain. There was a stage where we were getting a few drops. And it's quite a mission to drop all the flaps and then put them back up again, so I'm glad we didn't have to go through that. Okay. Where shall we stop? Let's creep a little bit further forward. All right. This is quite a small Ellie bull. I'm not sure how old he would be, but he's not a big boy. Or maybe he's just genetically not the biggest of bulls. And then to the left you'll notice a few giraffe. And they're kind of dotted out all the way about a 180 degree angle to our left. Beautiful. Hello to Anna. You are interested to know whether any of the other kind of antelope or gazelles ever get caught up in the chaos and confusion of the migration and kind of head back south into Tanzania? Not likely. I think quite a few Thompson's gazelle also join in, but that's known. But in terms of the topi and the eland, I'm not sure that they do in fact get caught in the confusion. But there are always interesting stories out here in the African wilderness, or any wilderness really, where sometimes the odds are proved wrong. Some zebra, some topi. Look like another herd of Ellie's in the distance there. And somebody passing by. Jumbo! Okay, well, you guys are about to get some great views of a river cam. Hello, we're on the river cam. And uh, we're just having a quick squiz to what's around. Isn't this wonderful? We're going to have uh, a few more of these set up. This is just the first. Oh, hi, bye-bye, butterfly. And we're just going to do a slow pan along the river. And this is at Dusty Crossing, or Vumbi Crossing as it's known in Kiswahili, uh, Vumbi being dust. Okay, and we're going to have a look for some crocodiles, and one knows one must never smile at a crocodile. And uh, let's have a look. Oh, what's that on the opposite bank? I see a, an antelope. Jared is our zoomy. Jared, do you see that creature walking uh, on the opposite bank? Let us have a little zoom zoom there, Gerard. We're going to have to get cam ops to, to help Jared. No, I'm only joking. Jared is doing this with a mouse, so it is quite difficult. Up, up skis. Oh, there we go. What have we got? Some, is that a Tommy, I think? There's some Thompson's gazelles to the left. And with a very dark, stormy sky behind them. Isn't that gorgeous? Hello, Tom Toms. Hello, Francis. Now, Francis is wondering, are the crocodiles massing at the crossing points, waiting for the Thompson's gazelles to take the plunge? This is a little bachelor group of Thompson's gazelle. 
Um, they don't mass. So what happens with the crossing points, because they're so regular, uh, that they, they actually become almost resident around those crossing points, and uh, they, they will stay there for all year, waiting for the migration. And the, the biggest and baddest crocodiles dominate uh, the main crossing points, where it's the easiest accessible for them to get a meal. And uh, they will eat zebra, Thompson's gazelle, wildebeest, and whatever else happens to fall within their grasp. Oh, there's some martins by the looks of things that are swooping through there as well. We're not going to ask Jared to try to follow a, a, a swallow on the river camp. Um, but there we go, isn't that gorgeous? Now, the coloration on the Thompson's gazelle um, is, is quite unique. Well, not unique in itself, but very, very specific. Now, you will notice quite a lot of animals will have dark black streaks at different places on their body, whereas their, where their bottoms are white. Oh, there goes another swallow through. Now, there's a, there's a couple of different reasons for this. Of course, uh, one could say following mechanisms in the case of the waterbuck. But in, in, in animals like Thompson's gazelle that spend a lot of time in the open, and you can see their tails are working extra hard, um, the flies are normally attracted to dark colors. And uh, so they have darker patches to try bring the flies away from their nether regions. And you can see around the bottom is white, and then they've got a dark tail. Oh, Tommy, you get a fright from another Tommy. Uh, you can almost see a Monty Python skit in the, in the male Thompson's. Like, hey, Tom, Tom, Tom. No, you're Tom, Tom, Tommy, Tommy, Thomas, 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 Thomas. And there's Timothy all the way off to the right by himself. There we go, a little bit of mock, mock uh, jousting going on. Uh, this is not very serious, uh, quite playful. Uh, the Thompson's gazelle are one of the few animals here that do have a set breeding season in a rut, and uh, we will be seeing that later on in the year. We're all getting a little bit more serious, but this is all practice um, that makes perfect. And you can see even while jousting, uh, they will still keep those tails working like windscreen wipers, keeping away the flies. Whoop, 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 whoop. Almost like they have an extra motor inside their tails to try and keep those flies at bay. Well, well there we go, a little bit more serious. You also notice um, they're quite prominent glands on the Thompson's gazelle's face, uh, which is quite interesting because some of them are, are semi-resident. They will move through areas. Oh, hello. Oh, I won. Tom, Tom beat Thomas. Uh, uh, Timothy's still the loser out to the right all by himself. Well done, Tom. Thomas is vanquished. Oh, yeah, let's continue down the river. Now, it doesn't seem like there are any crocodiles out at this very moment. There is a log that's not a crocodile. Carefully, we see it. Oh, there's a crocodile. Never smile at a crocodile. Now, that is one of the large crocs that will be waiting. Now, it's quite difficult to, to tell. Ha! Uh, Deborah, I was already actually starting to answer your question. Um, how difficult is it to tell um, between male and female? Now, Deborah, now crocodiles, the females will seldom get uh, over three meters. The males tend to be much, much bigger. And also, oh, he just blinked. Ah, I saw a crocodile blink in the blink of a crocodile's eye. Uh, here we go. Now, generally, this one I would say is a male. Now, it's probably a bit bigger than three meters, but also if we have a, a look at his head, you can see those very big sort of cranial crests that are made out of, uh, out of bone. There's another blink of a crocodile's eye. Now, those are more pronounced in males. Also, the, the thick plating, armor plating around the neck is also more pro pronounced in males. Uh, the reason for that is the battle for, for females uh, and for ideal spots where they can uh, keep females and mate. So, uh, depending on where you are in Africa, the, the breeding season for crocodiles can vary slightly, but it, it normally starts hotting up at the end of a winter, so from... Um, August, September, they tend to start getting into a bit of battles um, over core areas that hold lots of females. Um, and then by September, 
they are in full swing. Now, they normally lay, depending, as I said, it can vary a little bit month to month in Africa. They can normally lay around December, January, and uh, then it'll be about 90, 90 days to 110 days before those little critters hatch. Now, how you get male and female out of the eggs is quite interesting because it all depends on the temperature. So you will find all the, the eggs that are at the or laid first, which are at the bottom of the crocodile's pit, um, will generally be kept at around uh, 30 to 31 degrees Celsius, and that ensures that they are almost all female. Now, up at the top, uh, the ones that are closest to the sunny surface um, will normally be hatched at about 32 to 30 degree, 3 degrees Celsius, which ensures they are all male. So that's quite a fascinating little bit of crocodilian uh, information. Now, we're going to leave this crocodile who's waiting very patiently for what Scott's got on camera. So as the crocodile waits to gobble up the zebra, the zebras are busy gobbling up the short grass. And they seem to be enjoying themselves. Look at all the mud caked on this one's hooves and legs. Doesn't look very recent, but you wonder if it's already crossed the river or if it's just from drinking at a nearby wallow. It would be fascinating to know exactly how far some of these individuals have traveled. It's not all the zebra that head back south into Tanzania at the end of this time in the Mara. Some will remain here, so those, these could have already been here the whole year. And I'm not sure how we'll ever get to the bottom of that. It's so different for me looking at these zebra compared to the ones that I was used to seeing up in central Kenya where I've spent the last year. I'm going to pr pull out my book and get a picture to show you the difference because it's quite remarkable and in my opinion the one in central Kenya is the most impressive of all the zebra species or subspecies rather Let's hope I have it in this book. Oh no. Oh yes, here we go. So, once you've taken a close look at those individuals, come across and have a look in my book over here. And you'll see the mighty Grevy zebra. It's the biggest of the zebra subspecies and certainly the most donkey-like. Look at those big donkey-like ears. They even bray like a donkey. Their call is very similar to a donkey. Their stripes are very thin compared to the plain zebra and they also end quite high up on the belly. And I'm going to ask Senza just to zoom in on the top right picture because it's my favorite angle of a grevy zebra. How's that for a hypnotizing bottom? Awesome. So yeah, interesting the different subspecies you get through Africa. Wonderful. Good afternoon, John. You're interested to know why some of these animals will decide to migrate and others will not in terms of the zebra and the wildebeest that remain here. It's a very good question and I'm not too sure why. Um, something to remember is that there also used to be migrations that used to move north further into Kenya. It was a much smaller migration of about I think 200,000 or so wildebeest and zebra. and. That sadly no longer happens, but you know, a lot has changed over the years. It's not exactly how it used to be. Um, 
But yeah, you know, it's, I guess you could maybe like it to us as humans. Some of us like doing things some way and other of us like doing things differently. So I guess it could just be a difference in personalities and desires of the zebra and the wildebeest. I wonder if some of them don't kind of semi-retire, you know, it's like, oh, four migrations is enough, I'm going to retire in the Mara, or maybe retire in the Serengeti, who knows. lovely Laurie who would like to know what is the main species of zebra if we've just been looking at the Grevy zebra which is a, a subspecies they all part of the zebra family but then you could say they're all cousins so n not one of them is is the main zebra you just get some that occur more widely than others <coughs> the Grevy zebra sadly is highly endangered there's only about 2,000 left living in the wild on the planet, most of which are in central Kenya and Samburu, and there's a tiny little population in Ethiopia as well, I believe. Either Ethiopia or Sudan. I think it's actually Sudan. Whereas the, the plain zebra are a lot more widespread, but then you also get variations of them. But neither of them is, is a main, the main zebra, and it's the same with the giraffe. There's nine subspecies of giraffe, and neither one of them is the main one. Well, you'll be glad to know Jamie has made it out finally. She's been getting her radio rewired and she has found something interesting to show you. I have found something interesting. It is an Angama Agama, or at least an Agama that lives quite close to Angama. And I really wanted to show it to you because they're bright red here, a mixture of bright red and purple. They are absolutely gorgeous. Very good afternoon to all of you. My name is Jamie and this. We are back, hopefully for the foreseeable future, or at least until 6 o'clock this evening when the sunset safari ends. I don't know how much of the earlier bit you saw, actually. So, a reintroduction, I guess. My name is Jamie. This afternoon, Dave is on camera with me, and what I was trying to say was we're driving straight into that storm. In fact, so much so that our rain covers eagerly and we're anticipating it and fell down. But it's okay. We're all back to fully functional once again and on our way towards the Angama Pride. So for those of you that missed <sighs> Dusty. Those of you that missed the Sunrise Safari, we were with them this morning. Dorian, I can't remember what the average rainfall is in the Mara. I know that it's much higher. <laughs> That's my own fault. <laughs> 
I know that it's much higher than it is in the sands. I would guess somewhere around between 800 to 1,000 mils per year, possibly, potentially even more. But you're looking at a region of about double what we get in the sands. So lots and lots of rain. And even though we say that the rainy season has ended, it still continues to rain throughout the year. And of course, there's the rains in November, and then back to the, the rainy season <laughs> in January to around about May. Dave, that buffalo looks a lot how I feel. It's having a nap. Fast asleep. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. I'm pretty sure that buff yeah, that buff's fine. That's just that buffalo is just having the world's deepest sleep. Oh oh disturbed by the yellow billed ox picker on its nose. Oh, I can't think of a better day for an afternoon nap. Oh, he's up. I wonder if he's got that feeling that you know that feeling that you get after a long afternoon snooze where you actually don't quite know what your own name is? I wonder if he feels like that when you wake up and you think, I could really use a snack round about now. And that is exactly what that buffalo is feeling. Good morning. Yes, there's a storm coming. And there's an ox picker on your nose. Who hasn't woken up from a deep sleep with an ox picker on their nose? It happens to all of us every now and again. Oh, another ominous rumble of thunder, lots of zebra in front of us. I was hoping that the Elant herd would be out and about, but it doesn't seem that they are. Unless, Dave, what is that with those zebra? Um, you know, those zebra. The ones with the stripes? The ones sort of straight in front of me. Do I see an Elant? I do, I do! I do see an Elant. There's a beautiful herd that lives around here. And sometimes on our way back up the mountain, on our way towards the gate, we bump into them and I'm reminded just what gorgeous antelope they actually are. And then, if you look closely, you might see some peeping toms looking at us over the ridge. Oh, wow. It's even, lo it's even more rain than I thought while we watch the approaching rainstorm. 1,400 millilitres. Millimetres. Which equates to, sorry, what was that in inches, Beckles? Which is a certain amount in inches. And our rain cover once again, eagerly anticipating the rain by slightly um, preempting it. Thinking, speaking of storms, I know Scott was off to the south. That's the direction that the storm is in. Let's go find out how he's faring. Well, I'm hoping the storm is going to miss us. I'm feeling safe where we are here so far. But the problem is coming from out there. So as you can see, that large mass of rain falling from the clouds. That could make its way towards us, but I think it's already passed. I think it's going from west to east. But Jamie's been here longer than I have, so you may find she's more in tune with the weather patterns. I'm a rookie, Amara rookie, so I'm still learning the ins and outs of what happens in this ecosystem and loving every minute of it. Now this is quite a interesting road to be driving down. As you can see, it's probably one of the paths less driven. And it's going to be tricky to spot anything, although it's just opened up a bit here. But it's had quite long grass, about waist high grass the whole way, up till now. There's a big elephant bull across to our right over there, so I'm just going to try and get us a little bit closer and we'll stop and have a look at him. Actually, let's just stop and have a look now. The sunlight is perfect. You can see his massive white tusk glistening in the sun. Hello, old boy. Yes, we were talking about that beautiful tusk of yours. Don't hide it away. 
can see his temporal gland is leaking. That is an emotional indicator. He possibly could be in must. A sexually heightened stage of the best spot to look for that is between the back legs, which is a bit tricky in this long grass. Oh, no, it doesn't look like he's got much moisture there. Always good to be aware of the animal's moods and behavior so that we can behave accordingly and give them the space they need if they are possibly in a state of abnormally high testosterone levels where they can be a little bit boisterous and mischievous. which is where the word must comes from. It's a Hindi word, which does mean mischievous. It's obviously from the Indian elephants that also get the sexually heightened stage. This is where that word came from. Seems like he's not interested in having any snacks along the way, which is quite unique for elephants. They usually just snack wherever they go, but obviously he's going through a bit of a dry patch in terms of tasty morsels. And maybe he's heading to somewhere where he knows he is going to find something tasty. A bull of this size will eat huge amounts of food every day. Yeah, it looks like he may have had a little morsel there. Between 200 and 300 kilograms of salad. Hard to comprehend. Wonderful. I think there's a few more. There seems to be a herd up ahead. So let's carry on. See what they're up to. Justin, you would like to know what is the largest tusks I've ever seen, and that was a, a, a bull elephant in the Kruger National Park in South Africa, and his tusks were so long that they were almost scraping along the ground. The one was slightly shorter than the other, but incredibly long. And East Africa, interestingly, I think has had the, the most big tuskers recorded in Africa. So this is a good area to see big tuskers, but also down in South Africa you do get some. There's been quite a few of them whose tusks have been so long that they eventually snap off because they drag along the ground. Or you get some bulls who are man you <laughs> Oop. Oopsie, you still there Senzo? Everyone else still there? Apologies, there was a hidden bump in the road. So yeah, some elephant bulls, their tusks are so long that they can rest on them like a pillow for sleeping. Quite convenient. Well, Jamie has managed to make it down onto lower ground, so why don't you go and take a view from there. I have indeed managed to make it to lower ground and whilst the view is not as spectacular, it's still pretty good. Especially because I know that there are lions somewhere there-ish. Uh, just a quick uh, uh, heads up, we will be doing a school drive this afternoon. The schools will be joining us. I didn't actually catch their names, but I'm sure Rebecca will be providing me with them at some point shortly. I think she's saying Alton View Elementary. Mountain. Mountain View Elementary. Uh, mountain. I should have stayed up on the top of the mountain then. Ha ha ha. The schools will be joining us. A school will be joining us this afternoon in a few minutes. And obviously during that time, please keep sending through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And we will answer them as soon as the school drive is complete. But once the kids are with us, this is a very special experience for them. They get to go on a safari live in Kenya. So we'll be chatting quite a little bit with them. Okay. I just drove past one very relieved herd of Coke's hartebeest. Whoops. There's a road there. They, of course, are the ones that had a lucky escape not once but twice in the time that we were watching them with the Angamas. Ah, 
was going to show you a lilac breasted roller. Manu f saw his first lilac breasted roller two days ago. He was so excited. Oh, and apparently you saw one with Scott earlier. Hey, hello, how are you? Hi, guys. Good. Enjoy. One of the guests on their way up to one of the lodges earlier um, played a, a very, very highly amusing prank on us, didn't he, Dave? He pulled out a rubber snake and shook it at us. It was terrifying. I was frightened, Dave. Deeply concerned. Were you, were you afraid, Dave? So afraid. And then we laughed. Oh, how we laughed. Right, let's go find these lions. Oh. Huh. That looked like a glistening rock, but it's not a glistening rock. It's a hippopotamus that's doing the same thing as the buffalo was earlier. It, it too is showing all of the vital signs of life, the odd ear flick and eye blink. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that hippo. It's just enjoying a little wallow and some time in the sun. Warming up after what's been quite a chilly day. Phew. See what I mean about walking out here, though? There's surprises everywhere you look. Look at those, sorry, look at those Ellie's, Dave. They're posing so nicely there. The Ellie's are standing at the top of the termite mound under the matching trees. That's not them. <laughs> That's definitely not them. Well, while I point out our Ellie's to Dave, let's go across to Scott, who's got some wandering in the road. <laughs> what a beautiful scene. As this herd of elephants march through this open plain, with the Ololola escarpment in the background, It'll be interesting to know where they're going. They're leaving quite a big swamp, which we're going to show you in a short while. And they do move huge distances, these animals, in search of good food. So they could be heading all the way up to that escarpment. So, again, a mystery that'll be difficult for us to know for sure. Oh, well, you're interested to know if elephants will ever have twins, if that's something that happens commonly. And no, it, it's not something that happens commonly, but it could possibly happen from time to time. It's not something that does get recorded often. And it goes for a lot of the herbivores out here. Very few of them will give birth to twins. And what's interesting with elephants is they've got an incredibly long gestation period. So it's a 22-month gestation period. And then they give birth, and then it's a three- to four-year interval between giving birth again. So they do not give birth very often. They have to raise their young for quite some time. They did the young are dependent on them for quite quite a few years before they can afford to give birth to another that they can focus all their attention on. Good. Now let's pan across to the right and you'll see a large kind of open green swamp ahead of us. And then within that swamp there is a multitude of game Lots of herds of elephants. I think there's about three or four different herds all clumped up together. Cashing in on that green lush grass. A few waterbuck in the foreground. Some zebra in the background. Beautiful. So we're going to try and skirt along the outside of the swamp and then get into that tree line that you can see in the background there and then follow the river up the tree line. Some topies, some more elephant, loads of zebra in the background. Beautiful. All right, well, let's see where this road takes us. Hello, Justin. You're interested to know if I've ever seen an albino elephant. And no, I haven't. 
And I actually haven't heard of any documented stories of any. I'm sure there are some some stories, I just haven't heard of them. And you'll probably find that if any albino elephants are born, or rather leucistic, which is the white gene, they probably won't make it. You'll find a lot of animals, you know, they, they very specifically need their skin color. But it's something that I don't have too much info on, Justin. Coming to think of it, there's not many species that I have seen where you get the leucistic version. I've been lucky enough to see a melanistic serval before. That's an interesting beast to see. It's completely black. And a serval's a spotted cat, almost like a cheetah. So to see them pitch black is something quite special. And that was here in Kenya, in a national park called the Abadeas. Beautiful, beautiful national park in Kenya. Very high altitude, so you get kind of Scottish Highlands tundra. There's the terrain and the high altitude area, and then you get lower lying swamps, which is more kind of tropical, almost rainforests with open glades of grass. This road will be interesting to drive in the rainy season, that's for certain. Okay, well, we're going to send you over to Brent. He's found something interesting in the studio he'd like to show you. Now, I know a lot of you have been wondering about the Mara River and the history, where it goes and what it does. So, it sources in a swamp whose name I cannot pronounce in the Mao Highlands. In the Mao Highlands up here, uh, they get on average 1,750 millimeters of rain a year, on average. It hasn't happened this year. It then migrates through the Mao National Forest Reserve, this Mao West and Mao East Forest Reserve. It then comes out into an agricultural land, um, mostly small agricultural tea farms. Then it gets into the associated Maasai ranches, which is a large and small scale cattle farming before it then enters the northern conservancies, the northern Mara, Mara bushlands, where it is cattle and tourism. It then enters into the Maasai Mara National Park or National Reserve. It then flows out into Tanzania. Now, 65% of the river is in Kenya, or the, the, the Mara River Basin is in Kenya. 35% is in Tanzania. It then flows through Tanzania and in the Serengeti National Park, an area called the Lamai Wedge. It then leaves the rest of the river in this section here is mostly small-scale agriculture, tiny little subsistence farmers. Now, just before it gets to Lake Victoria, it goes into a massive swamp and for about 50 to 60 kilometers, a very important birding area, so lots of very interesting birds here. So it is one of the five major tributaries or major rivers that flows into Lake Victoria, which in the end become part of the Nile. You could say the Nile is even longer than it really is, but uh, there we go. It is one of the five major tributaries that flow into Lake Victoria, which is of course the source of the Nile, which is the longest river in Africa, flowing all the way down uh, to Egypt and out to sea uh, there. So there we go. Um, the Mara River is quite an interesting one. There's a lot of fluctuations seasonally in, in the river and it can go from as low as it is now this is sort of what we would normally expect it to be in August so it is quite low and but it takes one big rain in the Mao Highlands for that river to come up two or three meters in a matter of hours of course I have now got my my weapon of choice for being in the studio because it's quite dangerous and uh, you can see it's my my size sword it's also, that's what I needed this morning to keep cameraman in check. Now I've got it just in case. Okay, now since we are in the Maasai Mara and it is the home of the Maasai people, during the day today I did quite a bit more extra research on what I knew about the Maasai people. So they originate from 
Aha, around the Nile. They're known as a Nilotic people or Nilotic Hamitic people. So they come from South Sudan um, and around the Sud and further down the Nile River. They migrated, according to oral history, it's quite difficult to say, about 2,000 years ago. Um, and they either amalgamated or completely obliterated or, and pushed people in their way. And they settled from the Ken north of Kenya um, all the way through to Dodoma in southern Tanzania. Now, oh, it's long. Can't even see. It's too big for this map. Um, so, very, very interesting. And we're going to chat a little bit about Maasai culture again and history and their gods and stuff after the school drive. But Jamie's going to go welcome the school to join us. Hello and welcome to all of the students at Mountain View Elementary. It's really lovely to, have, lovely to have you and I hope you're all super excited to go out on safari. Now just a quick introduction, I think you kind of get an idea of how this works. My name is Jamie and this afternoon Dave is on camera. Dave's pretty shy, that's probably all you will ever see of Dave. And we are live here from Kenya in fact the southern part of Kenya in a fantastic wilderness area called the Maasai Mara and those over there are Maasai giraffe now remember because what you're seeing is happening right here in real life in Kenya it means that you can send through questions that you would like us to answer perhaps you have questions on what it's like being out in safari maybe you'd like to know hmm why a giraffe's neck is as long as it is. Maybe you'd like to know why these giraffe are bending down. And the answer to that is because they are eating some small trees that are down in the grass there. Because giraffe are almost totally browsers. In other words, they eat leaves, and generally speaking, not grass. So they eat leaves and not grass. But these guys are bending down because close to the ground there's some fresh, nice new leaves and new young trees for them to eat. So that's what they're after here. Ah, oh, the plan for this afternoon while we look at lots of giraffe and see if you can count the giraffe while I chat about what we're planning to do. Our plan for this afternoon is we're going to go and search for some lions. And the lions, we know very well, they're known as the Angama Pride, and they've got ten little cubs. Now, I can't guarantee that we're going to see their babies, because, of course, these animals are completely wild, so I can't predict exactly what's going to happen. But I'm hoping we can go in search of them and maybe find out where they're hiding. Generally, the Angamas are quite easy to find. So hopefully they're exactly where I left. They're not exactly where I left them this morning, but hopefully they're exactly where I think they are. So, Dave, hands up if you're excited to go and find a lion. I'm excited. Dave can't put his hand up. He needs... Oh, Dave's, Dave's hands up. Rebecca's hands up because she's directing and sending through all of your questions. So while we go in search of our lion, there is somebody else out here and he would like to say hello. Hello to everyone at Mount View Elementary. My name is Scott and it's great to have you with us. I'm busy driving along the edge of a bit of a forest on our right here and I'm hoping that while Jamie busy, is busy searching for a lion, we are going to try and find a leopard. Because leopard like hiding out, they're not as bold and brave as the lions, so they're a little bit more secretive. So big forests like this provide lots of good places for them to hide. We might even get lucky and find one up in a tree. They like sleeping up on big comfortable branches in the trees to keep cool. So holding thumbs, a leopard will pop up. Failing that, anything is possible and that is the joy of being on safari. And as I say that, we stumble upon a herd of buffalo. Perfect. Let's just get a little bit closer. And then we can switch off and take a closer look at them. This looks like a bunch of big old men. I don't think there's any ladies amongst them. A 
And just a reminder to all the students to give your teacher as many questions as possible for us to answer. We would love to chat to you guys. Beautiful big clouds in the background. And there we go. Now, just because they look like clouds doesn't mean they act like them. That's for certain. You can see the way he's looking at us now. They've got a little bit of attitude, these old boys. And they don't take nonsense from anyone. They even give lions a hard time. And they are huge. Look at all those muscles. You can also see he's covered in mud. They love to wallow in big muddy ponds to keep cool. And it also helps to create a protective layer. You can see there's lots of flies on them. He's even trying to get them off as we speak. And by covering themselves in mud, it makes it difficult for the flies to get to their skin. They're biting flies, so they will suck the blood from these buffalo and be quite a nuisance. Now, one of the easy ways of telling that these are male buffaloes is by looking at their horns. So let's look for one who's facing us. Here's some that are facing us to the left there. Oh, there we go. That's perfect. Now, you can see where his horns meet in the center of his head. The, the kind of bony structure. There we go. There's a good one. Meets perfectly, whereas the females will have more of a tuft of skin. That's actually not a good example, because he's a young boy. There we go. So the females will have hair between their horns. You can clearly see there's no hair between his horns. And it's got quite a big crown or bulge where those horns meet. And they need that to give their skull a bit of cushioning when they fight with one another. Wonderful. Oh, you've got some funny horns. Now this looks like it could be a female. You can see how her horns don't have that big bulge or crown of horn. Yeah, that looks like a lady. So there's one lady amongst the men, or at least maybe a couple more. Very good. So I hope you guys have had a good day at school. I wish that there was Safari Live when I was in school, but it wasn't around then. The technology wasn't nearly good enough. It was when I was in school that cell phones only started coming out. Hello, Sandra. So you noticed all of that mud on the buffaloes and asked if they like to swim. They can swim and they will from time to time, but they prefer rolling around in kind of muddy wallows. But from time to time when it's very, very hot, they'll even go into the water's edge and lie there where it's nice and cool. So they certainly don't mind water at all. And they are quite good swimmers when they need to be. Ooh, I'm feeling lucky here, team. There are lots of good places for a leopard to be comfortable here. So, we are going to need to be focused because they are very, very tricky to spot. The camouflage is very good. And even when they're up in a tree, it's difficult to see them. What you want to look for is something like their tail dangling down. You very seldomly find a branch that grows downwards on a tree, so that's always a good sign that there could be a leopard dangling in the branches. Okay, well there's one guy that you haven't met yet and he's not driving around in a vehicle. He's in the studio and he's going to have some interesting things to show you there. Go and meet Brent. Hi guys, me and my sword have lots of fun things to show you. My name is Brent and welcome to you, all you kids. Now we want to hear lots of questions from you. But what I thought would be quite cool is to show you where Scott is and where Jamie is and where I am. I am right there. I'm sitting on top of the hill, making sure that they behave themselves. Now, Scott is currently behind this mucky swamp, just over here. 
Jamie is looking for lions around here. Now, you might see some pictures above, uh, and you see this little pin here. Now, we've only been in the Mara for about two months, so we're trying to work out who is who. So, for example, these are all what we call photos of Angama lions. Although, she's in the wrong place because she's a sausage. Now, that means she belongs to the sausage pride, and she lives over here. Here we go. So we're still trying to figure out everything. You can see slowly but surely we're going to build this map full of pictures of the different animals. Now you're wondering why am I walking around with a sword? Well, it's because I like swords. But this is a very special sword. This is a Maasai sword. So it's a traditional Maasai sword that is carried. Ooh. Here we go. Very, very sharp. Got to be very, very careful. Okay. Put it back in, otherwise, I might cut my finger. Now, Sandra is wondering do tornadoes ever touch down in Africa? Well, Sandra, let us get to a good spot on my window. Um, we don't normally get don't normally get tornadoes here, but you can see there we go. So Jamie is about I'll try to find with my finger. Jamie's in that area somewhere there, and Scott said he was near that forest, so he's off to the right somewhere where that forest is over there. And uh, isn't that very exciting? Now, I'm not quite sure who I'm supposed to go to, but let's go send you down to... Oh, yes, no, you're staying with me. And we're going to go look at a very special camera that we have. It's called a crossing cam or a river cam. There we go. Oh, we've got some zebras about to cross. Okay, um, teachers, just be warned, there might be some... Um, gory stuff here because um, if those zebras decide to swim across the river the crocodiles will try and eat them so it can be a little bit sens for sensitive viewers a little bit, bit, bit trying now the zebras normally leave these crossings and the reason they're crossing the river is because uh, they're trying to get to the other side no I'm just joking so there's different rainfall patterns in different areas of the Maasai Mara and the herds of zebra and wildebeest will move around with those different rainfall patterns. So there we go. Looks like they're trying to build courage. Now there are very big crocodiles that live in this river and they will only eat once a year. And they only eat once a year um, and then they just basically don't move around too much for the rest of the year. Can we see any crocodiles? Jared is operating the camera for us. And let's see if we can see any big crocodiles. Well, there's a small, there is a crocodile in the water. Well spotted, Jared. Um, there we go. Not a particularly big one. But it is very, very interesting. So, and you can see all the birds flying around, catching the insects um, that live around the water. There we go, little swallows. Now, those crocodiles will wait months upon months upon months um, for them to arrive. And... Uh, then they feast for the next three months and then they don't eat for nine months. Isn't that cool? Okay. Well, there's a bigger crocodile to the left swimming, Jared. There we go. But I think let's leave the crocodiles for now and concentrate on the zebra. Malen would like to know how many stripes does a typical zebra have? Well, Malen, that is very difficult to say. Um, well, well, let's count them together. Okay, well, I'm just going to say there's about, we're going to do the one that's in the middle. Um, I'm going to say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, well, I would say more than 100. I've given up counting, Malen. And it also depends from each individual zebra. Sandra is wondering why are the zebras swiping their tails like that? Well, Sandra, it's to keep the flies away from their bottoms. So that's their, their very own fly switch that they keep switching. And there are a lot of flies out in the African bush. And particularly when you get big herds of animals, even if you have a big herd of cows at a farm, you get lots and lots of flies. So that's what's happening here. Jared, could you just come a little bit wider so I can see if they're going to cross? So what I'm doing is when I say something like that is I'm, I'm watching their body language and their behavior. So you can see there's this little ridge right in front of us here. I think they're too chicken to cross today, but we'll keep an eye on them. But I think they're going to keep grazing upstream. 
Wow, Clayton, that's a very good question. Why does the crocodile need to eat more often? Um, Clayton, the crocodile is a very ancient animal and they've got a very different metabolism. Now, what a metabolism means is the speed your body runs at or the speed your body breaks down food. So a crocodile um, take, can slowly break down food over a long time. It can also store the food it eats in fat. So crocodiles have very thick fat layers, um, particularly around their neck and under their skin. And that is a, a, where they store that energy that, that they get from food. So they can slowly release it. Whether it's us as human beings, we need to eat quite a lot because our metabolisms run quite high. And a crocodile's heartbeat, I'm just trying to remember now, um, will be ooh, very, very slow per minute. It all depends on whether it's doing action or not. Um, but, for example, our average human heart probably beats, depends, depending on how fit you are, 60 to 70 beats a minute. Um, whereas a crocodile, I'm just trying to remember now, is probably as little as 10 beats a minute. Um, but I'm not 100% sure on that. I'm going to have to double check. Now, crocodiles have been the exact same way for the last... 8 million years. Isn't that incredible? They are 8 million years old in this exact form. And uh, crocodilians, which is their family, so our family is, um, uh, well, so crocodilians include things like alligators, caimans, uh, American crocodiles. Um, and uh, that's why the crocodiles. Um, Oh, well, they've been exactly the same for 8 million years. Sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Uh, and uh, we have only been, our family, Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens, um, have only been around for probably half a million years. So they're much, much older than us. Um, and uh, there we go. A crocodile will beat, its heart beats only 2 to 3 beats per minute, where we beat at 60 to 70 beats per minute. And um, so that's why they don't need to eat nearly as much as us. Now, they can't breathe underwater, which a lot of people think they can. They can hold their breath. And because they're able to slow their heart rate down to two or three beats a minute, they can hold their breath for sometimes up to four hours. Isn't that incredible? Absolutely amazing. Okay, now Braden was wondering about zebras and what they were eating. Um, Braden's it was zebra's diet. Uh, Braden, a zebra is a bulk grazer, so it's not fussy. It eats all sorts of grasses. Um, there's a black-headed heron. Now, his diet is insect-based. He will eat small fish, small snakes, small lizards if he can, but mostly he will eat grasshoppers and stick insects and grass insects. So there we are, a black-headed heron. Here we go now. The zebras don't look like they're going to cross. They're moving moving back. Hi Orlando! Orlando is wondering are there any hippos in this water? Now Jared's going to see if he can find you one. Um, let's have a look. Jared, are there any hippos down the stream? That is another crocodile that went under the water. Uh, the crocodiles are disappointed. Dinner walked away. Now the hippos are normally down in that pool below here. We do have some geese as well close to us. There we go, Egyptian geese. Right, let's go see if we can find a hippo for Orlando. And there, is that one in the distance there? Orlando is also wondering, um, are hippos dangerous? They can be very, very dangerous, um, Orlando, especially if you're in a little boat there. They'll feel like you're coming into their territory. And hippos kill more mammals than any other, oh, there's another big crocodile swimming up, um, and any other mammal in the world. Scary, or they're not in the world, but in Africa. The, the mammal that kills the most people in the world, believe it or not, is a, is a domestic cow. But yes, so generally if they feel threatened, if you get between them and water, um, or if you get close to the water and uh, they feel like you are threatening their territory. Wasn't that fun when I got to sit on top of the mountain and look at a camera that is down on the river in the distance there that's the river there and we go but now we're going to go to Jamie who's somewhere down there still looking for lions I 
am indeed somewhere down here, and in fact, if I look up very closely, I can see roughly where Brent is hiding. But I don't want to look up at Brent's room. I want to have a look at the beautiful view in front of us, which includes three feeding elephants. And we're getting much, much closer to where I think the lions are, but I just had to stop so that I could show you some elephants first. I don't think you've seen elephants yet. So there we go. Three bull elephants, male elephants, that are enjoying their lunch. You can see their tusks coming off to the side. One's got really big tusks. It's actually got a, always got an itchy ear. One of them's got one really big tusk on the left and then a slightly shorter tusk on the right. And that's because he probably broke the tip of his tusk off. Possibly fighting, possibly even just digging in the ground or pushing it up against a tree. Oh, what was that that just walked behind that elephant? A warthog! There's a warthog behind them as well. And one thing that I find out here is if you sit still long enough and you keep looking, you find all sorts of amazing things. There's even some more giraffe off to the left of these elephants. Now, does anyone know what the collective noun is for a giraffe? What do you call a group of giraffe all together? There's a very special name for it. And it's a very lovely and very descriptive name. Here's a young one with the group of them. Right, while you think of what you call a group of a giraffe, I can tell you that a group of hyena is called a clan, and it sounds like Scott has found at least one. Wow. As you look through the grass, you'll see a few little ears. And those belong to a hyena. <laughs> Tricky. Oh, there you are. Hello. Yes, we're talking about you. And I'm glad you popped your head up because there's lots of people that were very, very excited to see you. Where are the rest of your clan members, though? Are there any more hiding in this long grass, or is it just you here alone? As Jamie said, they do live in groups, which are called clans. And they can be very big, especially here. In the Masai Mara, they can have families as big as a hundred or one hundred and twenty. So very complex families. You can imagine having so many brothers and sisters. The meal times can get interesting. The sharing the rooms can get interesting. So they live very interesting lives, the hyena. But they're mostly active at night, especially in this area and in the early morning. And that's what this one's waiting for. It's just relaxing, waiting for the cover of darkness before it goes out and looks for food. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are thinking that the hyena can only scavenge food, but that's not true. They're also very good hunters. And Angie's just answered what, asked, what do the hyenas eat? So you asked at a good time. They eat just about anything meaty, whether it's leftover scraps from a lion or a leopard kill, or fresh meat that they've killed themselves, but they really are not fussy. They'll eat even rotting meat, which is, ugh. Even the smell of it will make us feel sick, but they manage to eat it, so they do a good job in cleaning up all the leftover meat that none of the other animals want to eat out here. And that's very important, because if carcasses and dead bodies of the animals that die were just left lying around, that would open up room for diseases and sicknesses. So they do a very good job in keeping the bushveld clean. Ah, oh, thank you for getting up. Now you can see its spots, which give it its name, the spotted hyena. And Elaine would like to know if the hyenas will hunt at night, and the answer to that is yes, mainly at night, but all of the pred predators really prefer night, well not all of them, but most of them prefer hunting at night when they have the cover of darkness, when their eyes work better than that of the animals that they are trying to catch. Having said that though, they can still hunt during the day. And maybe that, that's where this one's off to, to look for a meal. But if we look ahead of it, there doesn't seem to be too much ahead of it. 
Hello to Brayden. You'd like to know how many hyenas could you expect to find in a clan? Well, it's a tricky question to answer. They've got lots of different size clans all over Africa. Here where we are, they get very big, so 30, 40, 50, up to 100 in some cases. But usually it's smaller, about 10 to 15, I would say, would be an average size of a clan. But there's no set rule out here in nature. And they make their own rules and often keep us guessing as to what they usually do. They often keep us keep surprising us by doing new things or us learning new things by spending more time with them. Whew, it's getting hot now that the sun's out. This area that we're driving through had some rain earlier, so the smell is beautiful. Everything is fresh and clean. And the grass smells very tasty. I almost feel like I could be a cow because I mentioned to Senza earlier that I would like to eat some. It smells so good. But maybe that's just because I've spent the day out in the long hot sun and I'm going a bit mad. All right, where are the leopards hiding? Well, as we continue our search for the spotted cat, we're going to send you back to Jamie for her search on the lions. I'm searching for a cat with no spots and I still can't find it. I don't know where these lions have gone. I'm guessing they must have gone down into the dip where we can't see. What was that, Dave? Oh, I see. <laughs> um, I'm guessing they've gone down into this dip over here on this side and that's where they're hiding or else they're sleeping flat in the long grass now Braden you want to know there they might be somewhere in here hiding in one of these shadowy spots now Braden you want to know how many lions there are in this area Braden um, I don't know exactly but I would say well over a hundred and fifty Remember, we're in an absolutely massive, massive wilderness area that stretches all the way to a different country, to Tanzania, to the south of us. So it's, there's lots of space for the lions to move about in, and because there's also lots and lots of food for them to eat, there can be lots of lions around. And I've already mentioned that these lions have cubs. They've got ten cubs. Three of them are very, very tiny they disappeared and I knew that they were somewhere here because somebody saw them about half an hour ago but now unless my eyes are deceiving me and missing the lions in the grass they seem to have vanished but I need to concentrate very very carefully on looking for these lions but I know that Brent knows lots about lions in this area and he's going to tell you more <laughs> 